Andrew Jackson is often remembered in history as one of the greatest enemies of the Native Americans, but the relationship between Jackson and the natives was far more complex. While the seventh president was responsible for the Indian Removal Act and the great relocation of the Creeks, Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminoles, it would not do history justice to only characterize him as the Indian remover and nothing else. This video is not an attempt to erase the past sins of Jackson or to justify his sometimes brutal treatment of various Indian tribes, but it is an attempt to explain the complicated relationships and interactions between himself and certain Native Americans. This video will serve as a brief history of Andrew Jackson and the Native Americans during his lifetime and how they fundamentally impacted each other. Jackson's direct relationship with the Native Americans began over a decade before he ever took the office of President of the United States. During the War of 1812, Jackson was commissioned as a Major General and played a significant role in the Creek War, a conflict from 1813 to 1814 that involved two separate factions of the Creek people. Though the War of 1812 was fought primarily between the Americans and the British, the Native Americans were deeply involved in the conflict, as many had made an alliance with Great Britain due to their mutual antipathy to the United States. One such example of this was British funding of the Red Sticks, a faction of the Creek tribe that fought against other Creeks in response to the United States' growing expansion into Native lands and what would be the Creek War. The Red Sticks had first attacked American settlers at Fort Mims on August 30, 1813, thus obligating Major General Jackson to retaliate against the Natives and quell the British allied Red Sticks in their civil war. Succeeding would mean an end to the brutal conflict between the Creeks and a minor victory in the War of 1812 as a whole, as the United States could gain control over parts of the southeastern United States that was under British influence. Jackson began marching with an army of militiamen through Creek territory shortly after the initial Red Stick attack, destroying the villages of Tallahassee and Talladega. On March 27, 1814, Jackson led his forces to destroy the Creek defenses at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, scoring a major victory in the Creek War. On August 9, 1814, Jackson signed the Treaty of Fort Jackson, ending the Creek War. One of the conditions was the surrender of 23 million acres of land to the United States, parts of which now make up the states of Alabama and Georgia. It may appear that Jackson's destruction of much of the homeland of the Creeks intimated that the general was a savage destroyer of Indians, but his campaign through Creek territory was what helped define his relationship with Native Americans as a whole as being complex. While his brutal military tactics and his unwillingness to negotiate the terms of the Treaty of Fort Jackson during the Creek War caused the Creeks to nickname him Sharp Knife, it was also during the war that Jackson found a small Indian infant he would come to adopt. The boy was later named Lincoya, and his family had been slaughtered during a previous battle. Jackson found in his heart a sense of compassion that caused him to send the boy home to his wife in Tennessee to raise him. Though Jackson's manner and lifestyle did not suit him well enough to be an attentive father, he called Lincoya his son until the day the boy died of tuberculosis at the age of 16. Shortly after the end of the Creek War in 1814, Jackson turned his eyes toward new prospects. The millions of acres of land gained from the Creeks in the Treaty of Fort Jackson was public land ceded to the federal government, but Jackson wanted to find a way to gain Indian land for himself. The land he wanted was more north, closer to his home state of Tennessee, but was claimed by the Cherokees as well as the Creeks and the Chickasaws. As Jackson was put in charge of post-war military affairs in the region, he marched north toward the Tennessee Valley, bringing along his friend John Coffey, who would serve as a land speculator. Jackson aimed to use his power to add Cherokee land to the greater Indian cession of land granted during the War of 1812, but he was stopped by John Ross, a delegate from the Cherokee Nation. Ross spoke to officials in Washington, arguing that Cherokee rights must be preserved, but Jackson was able to thwart both Ross and Washington officials through his fame as a wartime general and his complaints that poor white settlers also wanted that land. Jackson engaged in a series of land negotiations between the Cherokee Nation and the federal government, granting land worth millions of dollars to himself and his friends. What makes Jackson's land speculation so compelling, however, is that in the early 19th century, his actions were not viewed as wholly illegal or even immoral 
There is certainly no doubt that Jackson used and abused his power in some circumstances for personal gain, but there was also a greater reason that he argued for land acquisition. During the War of 1812, Indian tribes such as the Creeks had been friendly with the colonial powers of Britain and Spain, trading with them and allowing British troops to march through the southeastern United States to attack the Americans. Allowing the natives to keep control of that land, Jackson argued, was like keeping an enemy on your doorstep. He felt that the government had no control of the natives that, during the War of 1812, had demonstrated themselves to be hostile toward the Americans in many instances. Jackson argued that it was imperative for Native Americans to cede their land, and once he became a politician, he would eventually argue for the removal as a whole. In Jackson's eyes, he was doing his country a great service, and it was also a way that allowed him to get rich. Propelled by his fame as a general that won the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, Jackson won the 1828 presidential election, signaling a major change in both Jackson's life and his relationship with the southeastern Native Americans. During Jackson's first term, there was one major issue that he turned his attention to, the question of what to do with the Native Americans. By this time, Jackson had already established himself as a fighter against Native Americans, but that didn't mean that he was entirely opposed to their existence. The central conflict between the white Americans and the Native Americans was that white settlers were consistently encroaching upon the lands of the natives, something that would lead to frequent outbreaks of violence, where settlers would kill natives, or natives would kill settlers. Though Jackson saw himself as a direct representative of these settlers, he still illustrated throughout his life that he was opposed to this conflict and even would fight directly against settlers that broke boundary agreements and settled on Indian land where they were not allowed. For decades, the United States had not taken a firm stance on the conflict, and Jackson felt that it was his responsibility to end the conflict one way or another. His solution? Relocation. American historian Francis Paul Prucha argues that there were only four solutions available to Jackson at the time he became president. Annihilation, assimilation, federal protection of Indians on small reserves, or the removal of tribes to areas west of the Mississippi. Annihilation, or genocide in other words, was never considered as a policy by Andrew Jackson, and a choice that was unchoosable. To assimilate the Native Americans and the white Americans, would have been a disaster and likely impossible. The white Americans viewed the natives as savages and underdeveloped people, and the Indians found the whites to be appalling and their culture abhorrent. Federal protection of Indians on small reserves seemed to be the most appealing option, but Jackson knew this would prove to be troublesome. In order to make this happen, Jackson would need to establish different reserves for Native Americans to live on all throughout the southern, southeastern, and western United States, keeping in mind that there were dozens of tribes that would not want to live together. This option also required millions of dollars and thousands of troops to prevent white settlers from invading the Native Americans' land, and Jackson simply did not have either of those at his disposal. The country was still only half a century old, and there was no major military force that could keep tens of thousands, soon to be hundreds of thousands of white settlers in check for years. Needless to say, it would have been the least popular and most costly option. And so, on May 28, 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, and the next decade would be spent relocating the various Indian tribes west of the Mississippi. Some went peacefully, but many resisted, such as the aforementioned Cherokee official John Ross, whose political adroitness would help preserve his people's dignity for several more years after the act. Removal cost the government about $5 million, but this was far too little a sum for such a monumental act. Thousands of lives would be lost through the course of removal, most notably during the Trail of Tears. In his own mind, Jackson felt that he had preserved tribes such as the Cherokees by saving them from the conflict they were engulfed in. In some ways, this may be true, as these frequent engagements between the Indians and the white settlers were destroying the Native Americans as a whole but this cannot be described as wholly true. In reality, Indian removal helped progress Jackson's political agenda and create a country that worked for the men like him, the white Americans. Jackson's relationship with the various Native American tribes of his time was complex in the sense that it cannot be easily defined. It can be said that Jackson was both a killer of Indians and a proponent of Indian removal, but also someone who fashioned himself as a preserver of the Native Americans, a father to his red children.
while Jackson was responsible for brutal negotiations in which many natives were robbed of their land, and he was known to turn against natives who had trusted him, such as removing even the Creeks who had helped him during the War of 1812. He was also the man that felt he had saved the Cherokees, and he was the adopter of Lincoya. Jackson was a vehement racist, even for his time, but that's not all that he was. He represented the views of his time, for one must not forget that he lived in a time of frequent war between natives and white Americans, a time when settlers were killing natives out of greed, but a time as well where natives would wage war on Americans and potentially kill your family and scalp them should you settle in the wrong place. Jackson had a long and complicated relationship with the natives, and the implications of this relationship have changed the country forever.